Oh, hi. You guys, we almost made it. Thanks for sticking around. We have about 200 people in the room, so it's very exciting. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Lisa Gedgaudis. I'm with the city of Denver. I work with Denver Arts and Venues. My job is to support our creative industries in the city. I work a lot in music. I put out a music strategy in 2018 and ever since have been fighting to get funding, to give out to our communities, to help them thrive and get out of our own way. Uh, it's my pleasure to be moderating this fantastic panel of people. Um, today we have Tanya Dyson over here on the left uh, from Memphis, Memphis Slim Collaboratory. Um, we have Chris Nam from Listen Local first in DC. Bill Johnson with WRTI in Philadelphia. And of course, Mark David all the way from the UK with Music Venue Trust. Thank you guys for being here. Um, to set the stage a bit, we're talking about reimagining. It's been the theme all week, all two days. Um, <laughs> and maybe during COVID as well, right? So we've been thinking a lot about these things. Um, the music ecosystem is a delicate network of interconnected con contributors all in this room and beyond. Um, they are dictating how we access music, how we play music, how we learn about music. Um, and when this is out of line, when it's unaligned, we see how disruptive and, and disrupted our artists can become. Uh, when we're in balance, we can develop another way to adjust that paradigm and maybe shift our culture into thinking about how incredibly important our artists and our communities are and the worth that they have and be paying them uh, what they deserve um, and giving them the basic human rights that have been called out all day today. So with that, I also wanna introduce Sean Edwards. He is with Georgetown. Sean, come on up here. Um, Sean is a fourth year senior, senior with Georgetown. Uh, we've been learning a lot from the students here, and I thought it was really important to bring up a local voice and a young adult to help us answer and ask some of these questions as well. So he'll be joining me in moderating. Thank you. Um, let me let Sean introduce himself real quick, and then I want to go ahead and give everyone on our panel just one solid minute to introduce yourselves as well so people kind of get acclimated into who you are. Sean, you want to go first? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sean. Um, I'm a fourth year here at Georgetown, um, majoring in psychology. Um, I mean, I really got deep into music after, like, I was on my axis, and, like, I saw Michael Bracey's class, and I was like, this feels right. Like, for once, I finally chose something for me, and I guess so so right at the time and it was so funny how I'm here right now and it's like so full circle but um yeah I'm so happy to be here I'm so happy to be here with um the interviewees and the panel and I hope you guys enjoy it Tanya can we start with you for introductions Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanya Dyson. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have gotten a chance to, to converse with a few of you all uh, throughout the course of the week. Um, but like she said, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Memphis Sun Collaboratory in the beautiful Soulsville, USA neighborhood. We're directly across the street from Stax uh, Museum of American Soul Music. So if you've ever come to Memphis, you've definitely seen our building, and hopefully you will come to Memphis and see the building. Um, we are an artistic community center, um, and so we operate by membership. Um, we have four facets, um, artist development, preservation, um, youth empowerment or education, and also community engagement through music. And so we host um, two major events throughout the city, the Solon on the River concert series, which is our summer um, involvement in civic commons and getting people to take in free music in the parks that we pay taxes on. And then also the Soulsville USA uh, Festival, which is an annual celebration of the beautiful Soulsville neighborhood. Um, we work with over 
500 musicians throughout the course of the year. We allow musicians to join as bands. So um, we have 280 members on log, but that translates into five to 600 musicians throughout the year that we work with. Um, and so that's just a little bit of what we do. And hopefully I'll be able to tell you a little bit more of the work that we do um, throughout this panel. Shania wears a lot of hats, many, many. <laughs> so she's probably going to have very uh, different perspectives, but hopefully bring all of them to the table today. How's it going, everyone? My name is, uh, my name is Chris Naum. <laughs> um, uh, I, I co-founded a music initiative right here in D.C. about 12 years ago called Listen Local First D.C. And the whole idea behind Listen Local First was create alternate avenues for local music exploration, find new ways for artists to connect with fans, fans to connect with artists and create this collaboration and partnerships between local businesses and the artist community and the government. Um, I, this is, this is right now, this is really my part-time work, my passion work, my volunteer work that I do. Um, I have kind of have a day job. We don't really talk about, but, um, but the, uh, the, the work, the work that I'm focused on right now is a lot of it started. You, you guys heard from Aaron this morning, uh, the DMV uh, Music Stakeholder Collective. So we brought the, the, the music community came together to advocate for the needs of the community and bring resources, pool resources during the pandemic. We have over 350 stakeholders, part of our stakeholder collective that includes individual artists, managers, labels, uh, venues, uh, collectives nonprofits uh, that meet weekly to discuss issues. We, set, we send out candidate surveys for issues of the matter of the community. We write letters to the council. We advocate for any sector in the community, whether it's artists, venues, managers, sound engineers. Uh, I also am a presenter. I, uh, I've presented music festivals for over 10 years, um, three different festivals in DC. Uh, I, right now I'm only doing one which is called Down in the Reeds. It's a festival about healing through music. Um, and we just had our second year this year, even though it was our third, the first year was before the pandemic. Um, so that's the work that I do. I, you know, the, oh, the other hat that I wear is with, the, with Neva, which is here and do a lot of work with the Independent Venue Association. Uh, I work on their, I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Sound, um, Sound Ordinance Task Force, working with, cities across the country that are dealing with sound ordinance issues and how do you address the sound ordinance, whether you're rewriting legislation or creating uh, pieces of legislation that, uh, that deal with um, uh, agent of change, which is what we'll, I'm sure we'll get into at some point. And I also uh, uh, um, co-chair or vice chair of the Mid-Atlantic chapter. Uh, I'm Bill Johnson. I'm the general manager of WRTI, which is a public media station in Philadelphia. We are an all-jazz station, half classical, half jazz. Um, we were the first one in the country back in 1997 to have that format. Uh, as I tell people all the time, it's the same 12 notes, just organized differently. <laughs> and that you know, puts us in a unique position to be able to talk about music um, in ways that are about breaking down barriers. Right. We often get involved in, in uh, how things are different versus how they're the same. And so at WRTI, we have an audience of over 300,000 people a week, and we produce uh, dozens of videos. Uh, we produce a ton of editorial for NPR uh, that's shared with not only NPR, but peer stations around the country um, and in terms of arts and culture journalism. Um, and um, I personally am involved in music as a musician for over 45 years as a trumpet player. Um, I bring that to my job in terms of my values and what I believe organizational development should be, which is it should be a great ensemble where everybody has an opportunity to have a voice, where um, they are supported when they are sharing that voice, and where what we do together is much richer than what we could do separately. And I'll stop there. <laughs> David, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, a not-for-profit in uh, Kingdom called Music Venue Trust. Uh, it was established in 2014 to, with the aim of protecting, securing, and improving uh, Britain's grassroots music venues. Um, start there. Um, 
who sat there invented the term grassroots music venues. Um, at the at that point, um, those venues in England used to be described as the toilet circuit. Uh, you call them dive bars here in America, and in, in Australia they have the best one, uh, sticky carpet bars, which is so onomatopoeically descriptive that I really like it. Um, so we started that organization because in the UK, um, as we later found out by doing some research, 35% of all of the trading venues right across the UK had closed between the period of 2007 and 2015, a massive drop in the, the cultural infrastructure that should be available for artists and for audiences and communities. Um, we were reluctant to start it because we thought it should somebody else should do it. Um, which is a natural reaction when you've got lots of things you want to do. Um, but we, over a period of time, realized nobody else was going to do it, and actually the situation was serious. So we began our campaigning work in 2014 um, by hosting a conference like this, um, inviting venues that we knew from across the country to come to London and then taking them on a boat on the Thames to see how drunk we could all get while we shouted how absolutely terrible everything was and how somebody was to blame. <laughs> and from that, we formed something called the Music Venues Alliance, um, and that is now uh, the equivalent of NEVA in, in the States. Um, that was formed in 2015, I think. Uh, we have 951 members of that. We represent around about 97% of all of the grassroots music venues in the UK. Grassroots music venue mean the UK. Typically, uh, I'll do some numbers. Uh, the average capacity is 308. Uh, if you like the terms mode and million, the mode capacity is 250. Uh, they produce 172,000 performances a year, delivered to uh, 950 communities to over 22 million people. They have a gross turnover of just under uh, half a billion pounds. Uh, I've just looked at my currency exchange, so that's about $600 million. Um, however, their gross expenses are about $595 million, which means that they're make, operating on about a 0.25% profit. And so most of our work and the work what I'd like to talk about today is how do we change that? Um, why would, should we change it? Who's responsible for changing it, and how do we achieve that change? Thank you. So we've been firing on all cylinders um, the last two days and today especially. So we've covered affordable housing, climate action, all kinds of things. Um, we wanted to take this opportunity to ask some more um, curveball questions in a little bit of a spitfire way. So thank you for enduring our questions that we developed for you. Um, hopefully this makes it kind of a fun round to end the day with. Um, and Mark, you don't live in the U.S., but you can certainly be answering these questions, especially this one, to help us. Um, and feel free to start wherever you want. In a position of advocacy, if you were in front of the federal government, how might you provide one piece of concrete evidence to show that musicians are part of the public health workforce? so that they can receive more basic human rights, fair pay, housing, and benefits from their own work. One piece of concrete evidence you could provide the federal government. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Is the sky blue, <laughs> right? Do we need the sun? Do we need water? Do we need air? Our mission at WRTI is to champion music as a vital cultural resource. Why? Because music is a vital resource, like a natural resource. And that comes from our community telling us that, not us making that up. Our role in public media is the government created us. In 1967, the federal government said we need to have media in America, not just for the head, for the heart. So we inspire and we inform in public media. The music part in particular is the inspiration part. And music's made by musicians. And musicians are inspired and in serving this country day in, day out. Are they part of the public health infrastructure? Absolutely. We can't be 
the successful democracy that Congress created us for if we do not have citizens who can exercise their complete rights as citizens. That means they need to be informed, but they also need to be inspired. That's where music comes into play. If we don't have musicians that are being supported at a fundamental level in terms of their needs, we cannot have the kind of democracy that's going to succeed, period. And that's why the federal government needs to be putting more money into the music economy and supporting musicians in a way that allows them to have basic human rights like health care and recognizes the impact that they have on the health of the entire country. So I organize a music festival called Down in the Reeds, happens here in DC. The whole theme behind the festival is um, it's about healing through music in our city and how uh, sort of how, how music um, heals. Music has the ability to heal across communities and culture. And in coming up with this event, this event is hosted on the grounds of the Walter Reed Army Hospital, which is uh, an area that has obviously had a lot of suffering and healing over a century. Um, and so in talking to the music community, um, so many musicians that are from the DC area have had parents or loved ones that have had sort of part of this, you know, have been part of the hospital at the time or a family of service at the hospital. So they were like, in coming up with ideas or what can we do? Because it's a beautiful space, great amphitheater. Everyone kept on bringing up the idea you know, the idea of music heals, healing through music. And at the time, my, my father had had a stroke and he suffers from aphasia. But the one thing he could do that was like, no problem, he could hum a song, you know, you have to you have trouble putting out his words but he could hum a song he could sing he could sing along to a song so all of this happened like around the same time when it was creating the festival this totally makes sense I mean, healing through music is not like a, right it, it, right now it also seems like a little bit of a, a catchphrase of like oh healing healing uh, it, like but it, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but it's but it's it's it really is it really is deep and i i had another festival that was really uh before that we worked on where it's like it got people out and you'd see people just like getting up and dancing and like all ages like being together in the streets and and a part of this festival is about is history and um has a workshop component so we had you know musicians from ghana from bolivia from nigeria all of them with their respective cultural instruments and or drums talking about how like in these respective cultures there is actually a healing component of each of these specific instruments. And then, you know, you have a blues jam or you have a, 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 a picking jam. And each of these jams, like in the communities, are like, you know, this is like how people came together to just like to play, play a jam or pick together just to relieve stress. We, we have the data that shows what music does for people with PTSD, how it helps children with different sort of mental stress, anxiety. Um, so, I mean, we are collecting as a society the data on the importance of music actually being a healing tool. So if that's the case, uh, when there's so much medical information coming out behind the importance of music, then yes, the musicians are the vehicle for that. And, and I think, I don't know if that alone is persuasive, uh, on a federal level, I don't know what's persuasive on a federal level. I think only I, I'm only focused on the local level. But um, if there's a way to show you, but you look at other countries. I mean, I keep on hearing, you know, the, the idea of France and how, like, you know, a performing musician that performs, I don't know whether it's Paris or more France, like X number of days a week, gets a stipend from the city. To, uh, you get a stipend from the state or the county to be able to do that. It's like a living wage stipend because they realize the importance of, you know, you're probably getting on the street, you're playing in a bar, you're playing whatever. So, but, but that seems like, and that goes into a lot of the work around universal basic income. I think it's an important, it's an important part of this. I mean, um, these are, this community is essential. And I think we, we need to start think, thinking about all the communities that are essential that should be provided universal basic, basic income. Sorry, I'll be in here. Is my mic Okay, here it is. So, um, 
one of the, I guess, the, the to, to answer your question in short form, to say that um, what would be the piece of evidence that we would give? We have the data, and I'll say that, and then I'll give you the how. Um, I mentioned our community engagement programming. Everything about that's really our music programming, technically. But we've termed it community engagement because we use music to address a lot of the ailments that happen in our neighborhood. Um, the Soulsville neighborhood is uh, 3106, 3126, high poverty, um, low education, high crime, typical, you know, statistics that you see in a lot of our, you know, a lot of our uh, vulnerable areas, in a sense. And so we've worked with the community to figure out how can we use music as a draw to deal with a lot of the things that we have to deal with in the neighborhood. So. Um, Financial, you know, as far as finances, educating people on finances, no one's going to show up for that. Realistically, we've all sat in these think tanks and charrettes. No one wants to deal. You know, it, it's too hardcore. But if you talk about music, and then you have a booth that's set up to to deal with financial literacy there. If you have a booth that has a, a sign up for food, if you have a booth where the library is there and um, getting people signed up for library cards and giving away books, you have someone there giving away coats giving away, you know, different things, all in this festival environment. And so that's really, you know, how we how we dealt with it. As far as the stats and the data, you know, during our um, concert series, specifically the Solid on the River concert series, we launched that in 2019. And then unfortunately, we got hit with the pandemic the following year. So in 2020, we had to recalibrate. We didn't get to do it um, last year, um, in 2020 rather, but we did get to do it in 2021 and also this year. And the stories that we got. The stories that we had to listen to, people crying, saying, thank you for doing this. I just had three people in my family to die from, from the pandemic. And it's been absolutely depressing sitting in the house because we can't go to any of the music venues that we normally do. So the fact that you all figured out how to engage us in the park. And even in um, 2021, we had these social bubbles where we, you know, took it upon ourselves to spray the glass and say like, hey, you can get this. And so we had bubbles that were large enough to fit one person that were large enough to fit two people and bubbles that were large enough to fit families. And so people kind of just walked around the park and picked out their space. That alone, mentally on people, even us, you know, the impact of even, you know, because that's a whole mental struggle of putting on something of this capacity. But it was, uh, it was a south for us even to be around there. And so to get those uh, those testimonies from people saying how this helped them, how being able to get out into fresh air and be around other people safely and to take in music really helped them to you know feel like they can push through this. A lot of people have been living through depression. A lot of people have been you know affected directly, you know, whether they call COVID or whether someone in their household called COVID. We dealt with a lot of that, even with musicians, the you know, you know, the the loss of everything and figuring out a way again how to use music to help people power through. Like I said, the stats are there. We we normally do an economic impact um survey after each event but this the past two years we decided to take the word economic off of it so we just put impact and we asked questions like how did this affect your mental health did you arrive did you leave happier than what you arrived and how you know has this helped you in it and how this has helped and you would be shocked like when you ask certain questions that people aren't used to getting asked the answers that you actually get and the truth that you get from that and like I said we were able to gather the data and the statistics to show that this has helped this has impacted people health wise and our testimonies of ourselves just hearing these stories seeing the tears seeing the happiness seeing when people just be elated to be outside we have physical proof we've seen it the, you know and the proof is in the pudding that music is healing Music is a salve, you know, it heals. So us not necessarily being considered in the public health forum, you know, we, we, talk, we tackled this topic yesterday and I was kind of on the fence on whether artists needed another hat to put on, you know, it's like, we already wear so many hats, you know, take it from me, I'm the, I'm the hat wearer, that's the hat wearer, no. um, literally and figuratively. But, um, you know, do, do musicians need another hat? you know, to put on, you know, that's a huge burden to consider, you know, as far as uh, in health. But when you think about it, we spend all this money to try to convince musicians that um, they're businesses, in a sense. And what is the outreach and what is the, the language that we put around musicians being healers and being responsible? Um, Ted Poe um, got a chance to bring up, you know, the state of hip hop and it being in a negative state. 
So now the pandemic has really recalibrated us and to what we search for in our music. How much healing do we get from our music in our current state? And so that's why you kind of see so many things, you know, again, in a, you know, in an upturn in a sense, because people are rethinking the, what I take in. And how is that beneficial to me? How is that healing to me? How is it healing to the communities that I'm in? How is it healing to the children that I'm in? How is it healing, you know, as far as the educational aspect and how do these things apply to this new world that we're being forced into building? And so, again, you know, I, it's still questionable on whether musicians need another hat, but should we be considered practitioners? I would say yes, especially when it comes to our treatment and um, how we're looked up on and particularly the funding that is developed because we do more than just sing, we heal every single day. We heal. And that's really, you know, what it is. And Nina Simone said it best, an artist, um, an artist's duty is to reflect the times. So basically, you're not reflecting the times. And specifically, if you're not aiding and helping to move and push the needle forward to something more progressive, what are we really doing? So that's what it is. <laughs> should probably start what I'm going to say by saying I agree with everything that's just been said by all three panelists. And then I'm going to tell you something else, which is that I ran a uh, music charity using uh, music and health and education and in criminal justice for 20 years. But the question was, what would you say to a federal representative in order to get them to invest because of public uh, health? I wouldn't say that. Sorry. Uh, and the reason is because public health based on my experience, is overrun with lobbyists. It's overrun with uh, multinational corporate companies spending huge amounts of money to lobby government to ram pills down people's throats that they don't actually need. And the data that they provide in order to justify that is phenomenal. It's researched across multiple years. You can question whether it's valid or not. But if I had a, an interview in front of a a federal representative to try and get money into music to help us right away. There are seven or eight things that I would tell them before I would tell them the effect on public health. Even though I agree 100% with what you just said, that's not the soft spot for getting funding into music. That's a really hard one. Uh, we ha I, I, I can send you a video of the work we did in dementia, where a musician goes into a, into a room um, we had a, a, a must have been in his 80s. Guys, very closed down. Uh, Russ, the musician we sent in there, he just had a little keyboard. He started playing Daisy Daisy, which is an old English tune. Daisy Daisy. His head came up. He started singing along. He actually put his fingers on the keyboard and started playing some notes that were in, in, the, in tune. That wasn't even it. What happened then is, the song finished, he looked around the room and he saw his sisters and spoke to them and recognized them, something he hadn't done for two years. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, probably tens of thousands of videos like this. We, as people who love music, we know this is true. We know that it impacts in this way and we know this thing. Will we get federal, will we get politicians to fund that? Will we get them to recognize that that's the work or should we just be doing that anyway? And should we try and use any time we get the politicians to get the money out of their pockets that we need for the kind of portfolio careers that most musicians and artists have these days? And honestly, as somebody who does work all the time on this thing internationally, I would, I'd pick employment, I'd pick the growth of work opportunities for young people. I'd even pick education because the work and the data on education and the impact that music has on, on maths and English skills and everything is so robust that if you get a meeting with a, with a, a senator, please, please ask them for all the money for that. Because when you say the words public health, the problem we have is we all believe it and we know it because we've experienced it. But unless you're talking to somebody who's experienced it, they, it, do you know what it sounds like? It sounds like here's some magic crystals to make everything better, yeah. you know? And, and so the, the direct answer to your question, Lisa, is I, I wouldn't do that, even though I know we should. I would, I would use my 30 seconds in the elevator to say, do you want, do you want math standards to go up? 
make sure every child in America has access to an instrument. Do you want do you want the English literacy do you want literacy skills to explode in this country? Make sure that everybody has access to a cultural experience. That that's those those things will grab their ear and there's the evidence they can't fight and we're not fighting everybody else. Uh, I'll just do this very quickly. I'll give you the cheat. The real answer is we do talk to the politicians um, as, as part of public media. We, we go to Capitol Hill, we talk to them, and we talk to our local. All that really matters to them is how this affects their constituents because that's where their votes are. And so what we really talk about is the impact on their community, our community, and how many people are engaged in music in ways that are meaningful because that's who we represent and that's what motivates them. And that's why public media has been successful over at crossing over the aisle is because Big Bird is not a red or a blue bird. You know, Big Bird is watched by every household. And so from a strategic standpoint, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. And thanks for making it provocative. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so centered our, around our conversation about youth. Um, my next question is to artists doing performances such as Ariana Grande, Travis Scott, or like platforms such as Fortnite. As the music industry moves into the metaverse and the digital world, how do you bridge this gap with the work that you do, and how can you meet me halfway? <laughs> so um it seems like no one wanted to just jump into this question. <laughs> it's like I'll dive in and said that we got the thought, you know, the the curveball questions, but it is. Um I would say I you know, and I'm a very I give lead by example, so I give a lot of local examples of what the work that we're actively doing in that space. Um one of the things that we've done, you know, in that especially um in the pivot, you know, behind the pandemic. Um, was to provide living examples of it. You know, a lot, you hear the word NFT and you hear the words meta, you know, metaverse, and uh, hear these different things. But when you're working in a neighborhood that had to struggle with dismissing school and worrying about how the kids would have internet access to even do their schoolwork, metaverse seems like a very far fetched topic when we're trying to figure out how to meta homework. You know, and it's, you know, and so it's it's one of those things. But what we do is lead by example. We provide workshops and seminars and we, we did get a chance to pivot and shift and, um, and bring in real life examples. And so we have a few members that um, have one that has created one of the largest rooms um, on the metaverse um, called MetaCourt. Um, it's my neighbor and can give a real life example of what that is, um, what that looks like. Another artist um, that we have as a member um, mastered the area of NFTs um, so much so that he uh, was able to do ink a deal with LG um, with his artwork and some other connections with that. So what we've been able to do is provide real life examples of it and, and put those examples in you know within access of the youth that we work with to one and you know show that it's attainable. Not only is it attainable, but people that look just like you have mastered it, and so it really takes away that 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 bridge or that gap that they feel like it's that's something that's way over there and super unattainable for someone that looks like me and so we really work at stripping those barriers away to where kids can actively see themselves in these positions and different things like that so i guess that's a little bit of our example of what we've done and i'm gonna let someone else jump into this pool and swim around for a little bit well you know i i'm not coming i'm not gonna come to discussion from like anything like the personal knowledge, I, I feel like I've done a lot of research and I spent a lot of time doing the pandemic podcast, learning about sort of performances, opportunities, whether it's streaming or in the metaverse or in Fortnite, but, you know, or, with, you know, different NFT platforms. And you hear these stories about artists, you know, doing very well and finding these different audiences. I think that, um, I, I think it's amazing. I think there's, I think it's a very, I don't know. I want to say it's a small community. Um, that has found success. And I, I, I hope it's not like just like the comic book, like trader type community. Like, and if it does, it does get bigger because there are some parts of sort of NS, NFT and sort of digital, that type of digital assets that make sense in the music community. I really want to know how, 
I'm asking. This is like I'm turning it around. I that's. I mean, I I think I think festivals and events uh, are key to sort of unlocking some of the uh, open like the, the ever present potential of this. It's like it's like I, I've had a QR code on my business card since 2011. Not once has anyone ever <laughs> taken a picture of it in the last decade, other than the pandemic when, when, when you know, QR, started, QR codes started being used on, you know, menus. Uh, so what is, what is that thing that will get, you know, everyone adopting, and maybe it won't be called NFTs, maybe we'll call it something else. I mean, maybe the, the use is not for business cards uh, necessarily anymore. It's, they're, 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 you know, we've found other uses for NFTs, but... Um, what is that technology or what is that thing that's going to be able to let you experience on different levels? If you want to be a super fan, you experience on this level. So is it kind of like the GoFundMe Kickstarter level of different tiers? You get different things. Um, I think there's a lot to be explored. Uh, I'm going to keep on learning. I want to connect with the community that is exploring that more and see how it becomes larger and, 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 and important. It's something that everyone has to pay attention to. Um, I'd say there's two, maybe three things that our industry should do as public media. Number one is um, we have to break away from the idea that we are legacy media and that we are content first, and then we need to be open to whatever platforms people are on where we can meaningfully connect. And that's actually been a journey we've been on and we're still on, right? Getting used to the idea of we need to meet people where they are, not say, you got to come listen to the radio. You've got to watch television, you, right? We need to understand that first. Um, I think the second thing we need to do is we need to be realistic about why we're there and not superimpose, you know, ridiculous business objectives onto being on the platform, right? And we are guilty of that, by the way. You know, we need to understand we're not going to make money being there, first and foremost. So don't put that as part of your business case for being there. Make sure you're there to say, we want to just engage in an authentic way, which gets me to the third thing. Um, most of us should have absolutely nothing to do with how we appear in the metaverse. We should be hiring people like you and your peers and people who can relate to the people who are actually in the space and paying them to figure out how to tell the story and be authentic in the space. That's bit. <laughs> I don't have to learn what the metaverse is. I'm going to be super happy. Um, <laughs> and, and, and to a certain extent, I, uh, we talked about this yesterday, didn't we, Sean? It was, really, it was a really interesting thing because actually in that conversation, uh, I think when I approach the question you've just asked, it makes me nervous because I don't want to learn all about the metaverse. And, I don't, you know, I, we're on all these different platforms and, luckily we have a lot of young people on our team and so i think our messaging actually does resonate in a way that it wouldn't if i did it but what i would say is actually you told me you, i asked you questions and, and you, you told me the answers and then i was a lot more happy because what you told me what, what, what my concern is is the detachment between digital experience which generally speaking is free and, and easily accessible and quick fulfillment and the financial transaction and the effort and the dedication that is required to experience the industry that we currently have that pays for the existence of all that content on the on these platforms does that make sense but in fact in that conversation you told me that in fact you had gone out and bought vinyl records by people that you'd seen on tiktok and then i was super happy you yeah, saw so that so that made me it's just fading out that made me that made me a lot um a lot happier um i the answer is exactly what you've just said actually as these platforms come along i, I the our role should be to make sure that our content fits in that within that platform in a way that respects the people who are using it and do that and i would reverse that and say I don't think you should have to learn how to use a landline phone with, that's wired to a wall like I had to when I was your age and try and work out why it is that when you walk 10 feet away from the phone, it hangs up. 
So, I, you know, I they're like leave that old stuff, people, to old people like me, and I'll leave the new stuff to young people like you. And and do you know what? Having met a lot of you here, actually, I'm super cool with that. I don't, I don't like you. You seem to know what you're doing, so you tell me what we should do, and I'll do that. That's that works fine for me. I'll meet you fifty fifty there. I I just I just came up with with an idea that I I don't know maybe this is this is insane but uh you know I have a four year old so I don't get out as much I used to go and see four shows a week and I can't do that anymore but do I still want to see the music yes I mean should every venue and every festival have like you know what is that in in Stranger Things like the the the, the other side the upside down version in the metaverse or something like that so you can go I mean I, I would I would sit around and, and and go to shows if I can go and it's streaming you know where's Joe oh he left Songbird Songbird should have a a metaverse Songbird so I can go hang out in it I'll pay I mean it's the same thing you know like that's so so a big issue right now is actually like people are people are buying tickets and then not showing up. And venues are saying, like, you know, venues are like, well, let's make, we're not making money because people aren't, uh, people aren't, um, they're, you know, buying drinks, which is how the venues make money. But, like, you know, if I could go and attend a show and say that my metaverse ticket covers the cost of the like, streaming or the people in the metaverse cover the cost of streaming, you just get more reach, you get more people, you can grow the venue, the artist grows too, because assuming a percentage of that does go to the artists. Um, I don't know. It's up to you guys uh, uh, to find the business model there. The only thing I tell the Chris is that actually, although we're talking very loudly about the examples where it did fund itself and it did pay for itself, practically speaking, it, it really isn't returning the money required to do the production. Everything it's existing off the fact that people physically go to shows at the moment. I mean, actually, uh, um, we, we've in, in COVID, a lot of our our venues built streaming because it's very important to keep communities connected and it's what we could do and there are definite roles for it you know in in people who have access issues people who still feel uncomfortable in crowded situations lots of stuff like that but they're all losing money on it i mean especially on the new and developing talent angle of it where people aren't going to wander into rooms in the metaverse to see whether and hang around to see whether a band they don't know is any good or not they might do that if they're out with their friends and I nearly said something really, really outrageous, which is basically until they prove to me that the metaverse is going to still result in children being born, then I, I, I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm concerned about where we're going with that because a whole, a whole strand of what we do does result in relationships being formed, which are quite important to the extension of the species. <laughs> so, uh, I, did I phrase that politely enough? That was. I thought it was all right. I failed to say, look, you're not having sex in the metaverse. So that, that you can edit that bit out. <laughs> well, maybe you are. I don't know. Maybe you are. I think some people have figured that out. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I imagine we'll have time for two questions. We had eight. We'll figure it out. Um, what can the future of diversity, equity, and inclusion look like in your workplace and in your work sector? Uh, I, I don't mind going first on that. Uh, I'm planning my own extinction. Um, I, have, I have hired an almost exclusively female team because the music industry is stuffed full of people who look like me and we need to get out of the way. Uh, we have, we're working with Black Lives in Music to ensure that uh, we are hitting the targets we should be hitting for our community to represent our community effectively within our own organization. And then broader than that, I would say that I still believe your, I believe, first of all, you can't be it if you don't see it. That's a really basic cultural principle. But I also believe that you're more likely to believe that you can be it if you see somebody that looks like you. And I think until we change the industry the, from the ground up with, with people who look like our communities, then, then that's the work we should be doing. We have to replace the model that we've had. You know, the, good, well done for them. You know, well done for them. They, they built an industry that worked for them, and that's great. We're past that now. We need an industry that works for everybody, and we need to be doing the work to make our industry look like our communities. 
Well, I'll jump in here. Um, you know, and some may say as a as a, a nonprofit that's centered in a black neighborhood that's led by a black woman that we may not have an issue with DEI. But one of the things that I've realized that um, there are other marginalized communities that we were not um, bringing in. And so one of the things that we've done now is to bring in translators um, and to translate um, to a lot of the other communities, larger communities that we've developed, you know, and have a classmate that was able to translate um, our forms into to Arabic. Um, another classmate, or neighbor rather, that um, was able to trans, um, translate things into Spanish. Um, and then actually them, um, recruiting them as mouthpieces to the communities, to their specific communities, to bring in others. Because every other culture, every culture loves music. And so the thing with Memphis Slim House, again, sitting in the, in the middle of this black neighborhood, we didn't want to get too jaded or polarized and caught up in black and white that we did not take the initiative to, to again, round up other marginalized communities that may not have this access, may not have these types of spaces, but also enjoy music and making sure that we were all inclusive and making sure that we did provide a space for everyone. Um, and made, you know, making sure that they felt welcome by again, you know, offering the translation. Just seeing your language on a website is it speaks a lot. You know, it just shows as far as the you know how welcome you are in that space that someone took the consideration to write it out in your specific language to communicate with you. And so that's some of the things that we're you know doubling down on because, like I said, we we've had everything else to check you know check marks on everything else, but that was one of the things that we're uh, working on. Um, you know, towards the close of this year and specifically going into 2023, it's just how do we include other marginalized communities to make sure that we unite and unify those communities over these resources to, to better build the city up. This, that is, that is amazing. I mean, that's, and from, from festival production standpoint, I know this is something we've been building towards and you're always like at a point where you're like, how do we make this happen with like limited budget? But this is also something that I think we should be working with with our local governments on this is an important thing they every uh, you know every city has a are, they're forming these offices of uh you know di or, or disability rights and, and, and i think i think that this is this is the role that these that these offices should be playing and there should be funds set aside for this type of support but that is really amazing and and having a small festival i know that that's like our our number one thing to do is like more translation um having uh you know, having um, uh, I'm 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 blanking on the correct word, but having having peep translators on stage, um, uh, so that's something that I think I think is our our real next step and is really important. I think also from 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 including like DEI in the work. I think stakeholder groups, whenever whatever you're building, whether you're building a advocacy coalition or whether you're bringing, building a stakeholder group, it's 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 uh, so whether you're building a festival. I think it's important to have the stakeholder group that is actively seek out members that are not within your circle, because it's so easy to just go within your circle or the people you've worked with. But but you know we've brought in the churches in the community into our into our work because like obviously healing and music and churches is like the most i mean that that is healing in music, right um we've brought in mosques we've brought in um other other religious religious organizations from the community into our stakeholder group so that so that it's it's um it's we are making sure that everyone has a place at the table in the planning and then that that includes the staff and the volunteers and the people that come into the event i think there's something we're, we're doing now we're working on that is a piece of legislation that we hope to push through on the local level in 2000 uh in, in 2023 is this um a fair trade music legislation essentially if the city is funding an entity whether funding a festival or funding or, or giving a tax rebate to a venue through our venue tax rebate program that we have here. Um, each of these entities receiving the funding should have, should meet this like fair trade music that which is like fair pay. Everyone has contracts sort of best practices, but that in that best practices that there's a venue in the person there's, there, there should be a number of DEI sort of guidelines in there that you are, you know, you as a venue are, working with multiple communities your staff is diverse you have certain things so i think that's an important part of our fair trade music you know the, uh, part that we've added in and we want to really focus on we're, we're going to try to pass this this legislation 
uh, this year. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to working on that too. Um, I, I'd quickly say two things, authenticity and intentionality. 80% um, of our leadership team is BIPOC. Um, that's not because we sat down and we said, oh, we we're going to make, mm -hmm, but that's because music is the model. And music is about merit. If you can play, you can play. I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you came from, right? Um, I had one of the worst exchanges I've ever had in my professional career with an out-and-out -out racist um, a couple of years ago after George Floyd, you know, and he sent this terrible message on the 4th of July. And it was like, you know, because he was mad about some of the people we had played on the air. And I just wrote back to him and I said, I don't know why you could possibly listen to, or how you could possibly listen to music with your eyes and not your ears. And so, you know, it's, it's important to see the leadership, um, but it's also important to challenge the existing systems and, and fault lines that you have, right, in, in whatever industry you're in. And for us, in particular in classical music, you know, that's a rough one. We are full of fault lines, right, in terms of what we think the music is, why we think it's relevant, who it should appeal to, who it has appealed to, um, how we talk, like all this stuff. So one of the things we're doing is we're simply coding our classical music database with intentionality. Is this a female composer, female performer? Is this a black composer? Is this a Latinx? Just going down the line and literally saying we have to be more intentional about what it is that we're programming and making sure that we're sharing that with the audience, not in some lecture way, right? But just simply in an informative way. You probably didn't know this. Cool, huh? Right? You didn't think that this was associated with classical music because we've been screwing it up for the last 50 years in terms of talking about it. Or frankly, we haven't had the recordings to showcase some of the most brilliant composers that have been out there because they never had the opportunity to have their works recorded at a high enough level that they could stand next to a recording of a Beethoven or a Bach or a Rachmaninoff or whatever, right, by a major symphony orchestra. So again, I think we have to be much more intentional about our core product and, and, and ensuring that we're doing our best work. And then the third thing I'll say very quickly is we've got to push ourselves to get outside of our known universe. So for instance, right now we're in the middle of a classical music diversification study with a station in Seattle, a station in New York, a station in Oklahoma, and one in Philadelphia. And that's a national study done by a well-known research firm that's going into just doing focus groups as well as surveys in each of our markets but also doing a national survey to find out the alignment between the two. But the object of this research is not our own listeners. The object of the research is people who are out there who have some level of affinity with classical music, but aren't, aren't listening to us. And we are targeting, you know, uh, the Asian community, Black America, Latin America, um, <clears throat> indigenous and white America to understand how they all perceive what we do, but most importantly, how they engage and perceive this music so that we can challenge ourselves to go beyond our comfort zone and say, if we're going to be authentic and reach you, who has an interest in classical music, just not an interest in, in us and the way we do it, we're going to have to listen to what it is you, you see and think and hear about us that, um, whether you think about us at all, by the way, and in many cases, what's really rough in this research is when they start telling you we just don't exist in their world. Oh, I don't like to hear people talk about classical music. Holy cow, that's exactly what we do, right? Like, how are we going to make any money if we can't tell you about classical music? Or I only listen to stuff referred to by my friends. That's not radio, right? We curate, we project. So all of these things are going to force us to acknowledge that we are not all that. And we're going to have to think differently if we're going to reach out to more diverse communities. Thank you. Um, just the final question. Um, tell us about a more recent or up and coming artist that you are listening to. And to you, um, how do you see them as a strong influence in the future of a more reimagined music industry? So I'll jump in on that one too. Um, well, you know, I, I, would, I would be remiss if I did not bring up, you know, our hometown here, or like a few of them. Um, speaking of Marco Pave, of the Tennessee, um, and also he did his recent Grammy nomination um, as of this week. 
um, with a the really amazing message. Um, another band that I've really, really enjoyed is actually out of the, the UK. It's a group called Salt, spelled S-A-U-L-T. You know, they just recently did the drop where you can get a lot of their music for free. Um, but that was kind of going into what I was speaking of earlier about the healing, the regenerative music that we get, and, you know, and choosing what we um, opt to take in, you know, in our, in our own personal healing. Their music is amazing, you know, and it speaks of, you know, what, you know, whatever, you know, higher power that, you know, that you acknowledge, they speak to all of that. And they speak to, you know, again, music being in there. And I, and I really kind of gravitate to any artist that, that does that, but I, I really like them at the moment. Because they're a conglomerate of other, you know, like Cleo Soul and a few other artists, the artists that I like that have come together to create this amazing project. So, yeah. Five albums, too. Five yeah. albums for free. Um, I think Cumbia is the new punk. And this is being written about now, but I'm there are like a number of Cumbia bands in DC. There's one Cumbia height that just heights. There, these, these guys are amazing. And, and I don't know whether it's just like I've found this like, rabbit hole that i'm going and i've listened to cumbia over the years uh plenty but there are a couple of national bands that are touring that are getting really big and local bands that are growing so that's really been been something i've just been really interested in, in terms of just like getting out and going to shows i've seen this one band you know i don't i'm not getting out that much but in the past like two months i think i've seen them three or four times um God, I listen to so much music every day, all day long. Uh, <laughs> it's just never fair to pick one. Um, I, I'll hold up one of our, one of our Philadelphia uh, uh, talents, a young man named Emmanuel Wilkins, saxophone player, uh, alto player, who is phenomenal. If you haven't heard him, you should. Um, he can play anything, whether it's traditional rap, whether it's... Um, fitting into contemporary genres, whether it's playing with masters in a completely free environment, um, he's extraordinary. And I think he represents the kind of brilliance that the current generation of jazz artists who are at the top of their game, um, you know, they're charting the way for how we should think and hear about music, hear music, because they are able to be so fluid across any, any medium you put them in. Right, any setting you put them in, they can meaningfully make statements and support other musicians and expand the vocabulary of the music. Which really, you know, I don't want to put that on them, but I've heard them do some things. I'm like, I don't think I've ever heard anybody do that, you know. So, Emmanuel Wilkins, all the best music is being made in London right now. <laughs> Uh, so that's going to be easy. Uh, well, no, 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 fair enough. Some of it's from outside London. It's just from England. Um, I would go for, uh, Bob Villain, V-Y-L-A-N, who is a remarkable live artist. Uh, I would probably throw Nova Twins, uh, who have a pretty revolutionary take on rock music. Um, Clip Trip. Uh, C-L-T-D-R-P in case you're wondering how we're going to get that on the radio um, that's uh, uh, LGBTQ um, representative band uh, and probably Nimo from that same circuit I could go on with those but the thing that unites all of these bands um, that are coming out of England right now is they are extremely political they are representing their communities in a way that is really eye-opening they're not taking any prisoners about it and the music is super exciting and i would say that punk is the new punk <laughs> if i if i can can i jump right back in just to add two more names so um i, I again i i gotta shout out Memphis, but this is on the map right now you know if you're not paying attention to the, the musical renaissance that's um uh, that's happening in memphis it's, it's definitely something to be observed coming from a you know a musical city that's always been based off of legacy and history to see the present and the future really making an impact and standing its own ground with that legacy you know with artists like isaac hayes and you know aretha and carla and you know rufus and all of them but um two in particular speaking of the stacks artists um, an artist by the name of Kirby um, that is out of Memphis and also an artist by the name of Mono Neon. 
uh, both of them are products of Stacks Music Academy. And that, that was a question that you all asked about youth engagement and how to get youth involved. That's a definite example because these two artists are leading in what they do. Mono Neon, if you haven't heard of him or seen him, you know, you see him before you hear him most of the time. Mono Neon, Neon is definitely, you know, the thing. He just recently um, did a partnership with Fender. He has a new specialty base. Um, that is Neon. It's amazing. Um, if you know him, um, he went into um, to tonal studies at um, at Berkeley, and so his whole, uh, you know, how he plays. And when I say Mono Neon has been this way, I, I was fortunate to teach both of them um, when they were younger and at Stax Music Academy. Um, but Mono Neon really, um, really is just prime example of staying true to yourself and being who you are you know and showing up you know he prints watched his videos and called him in and was like hey i want to jam you know not everyone can say that they're privileged enough to, to have prince to call you and say hey i'm flying you up tomorrow i want to come you know i want you to come and jam but uh these are just two shining examples of two people who made it out of Memphis, who made it out of this legacy town that people never thought that we would have this resurgence of the industry and they really became their own artists and they really took charge of their artistry kirby decided to do a song every single day and she did a, a 365 project where she decided to write a song every single day i think by the 17th song she was picked up um the song die for you that beyonce did to dedicate um to jay-z was written um you know by kirby there was a song on um I don't know if we could say his name, Kanye's album, but um, <laughs> that person. But um, you know, she wrote for so many different, so many different artists, and they're again prime examples of when you feed the youth and give them access to real life examples, and not just examples, but positive avenues to really be themselves and encourage them, and don't get you know caught up in the legacy fatigue of wanting to fit the model that's already existed or already been there. And they they took that and they they stood proudly on the backs of the you know of the legacy artists that were there, but then they transformed what they learned in this history that they got, and they really created this whole new thing with it and now they're leading the charge and, and so like i said that's a prime example again when you have the history and you also have the encouragement of the youth to work in tandem with each other and now we're beginning to see the you know what you know the i guess the fruit of that whole effort and in so many others jazzy you know if old town road she hates that you know that to mention old town road but that was one of the biggest ones um was, um but it's so many different artists that are emerging from Memphis right now that I'm so proud of because I've watched them get it from the mud, you know, as youth and hit, heard their stories and, you know, drive their tears in certain instances of them being afraid of, you know, having to leave their cities and not having an infrastructure, you know, and feeling like they, you know, they don't want to negate the history, but they didn't see their part in it and all of that and you know and, and and letting them know it's okay to leave but to keep home inside of you you know regardless of where you're at and again to see them emerge as leaders in the industry and not just you know i'm not talking them up because they are from memphis but they genuinely have great music because it's a bunch of people from memphis i could talk about but the music isn't all that positive and so i don't definitely want to you know steer towards that but like i said they're amazing so my only on Kirby, you know, if you ever, you know, want to listen, Mono Neon has an uncanny way of making you happy, you know, in, in the weirdest sense, because happiness always translates to his music, because he's very happy being himself, and I think that's what the world needs right all, now. All, all English music just makes you really angry, <laughs> really properly angry, and I, I think in this particular cycle of where we are in the world, anger is pretty important that we should all feel it. Like, go and listen to Benefits. You've never heard an angrier band. War, orgasm super super angry and you know why they should be angry they should be angry about the state of the world and the state of the music scene and so i i just love all that angry music that's coming out at the moment thank you all so much can we give our panelists a round of applause and what would this panel be if i didn't ask sean edwards how he re reimagines the future and what is your advice to our panelists and the people in this room since you've been watching and participating the last two days with us. 
Um, hey, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, I guess some advice would definitely, um, to make, make room. I mean, I've always felt like I never, I guess, like, had that voice to really, um, share my input. Um, you know, if you know, normally, like, older adults, they shut you down. I mean, naturally, sometimes, but I definitely think if we want to reimagine an ecosystem that's aligned and an ecosystem that works for our future, I mean, the children are our future. So, I mean, so definitely making room and allowing yourself to just, you know, take a step back and use what you've learned and your experiences to influence people like me, influence so many other people people who came out today um and yeah and thank you again so much for all of your input and all of your advice